Hi, welcome to the Space Science University for the Space Science at IU Abu Dhabi in collaboration with the UAE Space Agency. Our today's speaker is Professor Edwin Kite. He is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago's Department of Geophysical Sciences. He got his bachelor's and master's degrees from Cambridge University, a PhD from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Then he was the OK Earl Fellow at Caltech. Uh, he published, uh, he has published a number of important papers on planetary habitability. Uh, he's interested in both solar system planets as well as exoplanets. And today he's going to talk about his very interesting recent work on Mars. So Edwin, uh, once again, welcome to our center and I'm handing over the mic to you. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so uh, today I'll talk about how Mars's surface became uninhabitable. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of the people shown here. Um, this uh, talk is timed for uh, 36 minutes. So please interrupt at any time with uh, any question. Uh, so you, there's time for Q&A during the talk. Um, so Perseverance uh, landed on Mars uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, so I want to start off by uh, seeing what Perseverance saw uh, on its way down. Uh, so I'm going to uh, stop the slides and show a video. So if I'm doing this right, then you should see a uh, black screen, Dimitri, with a little parachute in the bottom left? Yep, yeah, yeah. OK. So you've been cooped up for nine months inside this dark box, and then the heat shield falls away, but you're still moving downwards at uh, 200 meters per second, even under parachute, because the air on this planet is so thin. And the first thing you can see is impact craters. So that tells you that this is now a geologically quiet planet with a thin atmosphere. Otherwise, lava and sediments would bury the craters like on Earth, or the impact ores would burn up in the atmosphere like Venus. And the wind has sandblasted out these mile wide scour holes. So you can see in layers of relatively old material. Now in the top right, something different. A river delta, a high plateau with the ridges showing the location of the river deposits. Point bars and floodplain deposits and channel belts. So this is the main target of the mission. It's now wind eroded. And that's good because wind erosion uh, exhumes fresh bedrock that hasn't suffered the radiation that can destroy biomarkers near the surface. And you're looking to get samples with biomarkers. OK, sand dunes. So this planet isn't geologically dead. There's enough atmosphere for wind to move fine particles around. Uh, getting closer, uh, we can see off to the left uh, the MAFIC floor unit, which we hope to date radiogenically to get an absolute time anchor for the geologic action at Juzero. Uh, so the ages I'll be talking about today aren't well calibrated yet. Uh, so can't land on sand dunes, you'll die or be trapped. Uh, landing in small craters is bad too. Some of those are inescapable hazards. So now we're off the parachute onto the thrusters and the spacecraft is diverting. Uh, you could see layering in the delta front for a second there. So at this point, the spacecraft was banked very steeply trying to get away from the sand dunes. Um, so the view passed over a rugged carbonate bearing unit. Um, so much better uh, for a landing site now, what you see is uh, bedrock, origin unknown, cause of the fracturing unknown, starting to kick up some dust and gravel, uh, time for the spectrum maneuver. So you're looking both up and down on the left. The rover is being lured at the end of three cables. Uh, on the right side, you're, uh, on the left side, you're riding with the rover looking downwards. Uh, so the combination is being lowered on those three cables. And so the descent stage uh, departs. You can see the descent stage departing. Uh, and that's a successful landing. So that's the sort of introduction to the current mission. So I'm going to uh, go back to my slides now. A great video, this. 
great video this. Uh, I'm glad it came through. Uh, Dimitra, if you see questions uh, in the chat, then please, please let me know because I'm in full screen, I might not spot them. Sure, sure. Um, sure, sure. Okay. So exploring Mars is a challenge. It requires hundreds of people uh, to work together and catch each other's mistakes. And Mars is also a book of secrets. Over the past decade, evidence for habitable environments beyond Earth has become unequivocal, including early Mars, uh, recorded by the sedimentary rocks in Gale Crater, shown here. We don't understand the origin of life, and we don't know if life ever existed beyond Earth. But regardless of whether or not life established itself in these habitable environments on early Mars, their apparent complexity poses a grand challenge for geoscience. Uh, or several actually. What does sedimentary deposit accumulation on Mars record and how can we read that record? Can we identify simple rules for planetary evolution and how do planets stay habitable? Finally, Mars is a destination. Uh, today it's the only planet uh, that we know is inhabited solely by robots, but we don't expect that will always be the case. Uh, so these rovers are pathfinders uh, for human explorers. So here is Jezero, uh, here is the rover location. Uh, false colors, uh, key to mineral type, uh, plenty of carbonates, uh, the greens and blues here, and the delta itself is full of uh, clays and mafic minerals. And the overall view here uh, from orbit sums up the big question about Mars habitability. Today there's a cold sandblasted desert, uh, nothing moves except for sand dunes and avalanches. But here we have a river valley, now dry, cutting through the crater wall on the left, and the river drops off sediment when it reaches the calm waters of a crater lake forming a delta. And we see this all over Mars. Jezero is just one example. So the challenge is what allowed uh, for an ancient habitable environment on a planet orbiting far from a faint star, the young sun. Uh, so this is the early Mars uh, climate problem. And this early Mars climate problem has been a problem for over 40 years. And it stayed a problem because most proposed solutions either fail to match the geologic constraints or they aren't internally, physically, and chemically consistent. And I want to take a step back now and talk about how does habitability work on the Earth, the only example that we mostly understand. So the most important climate regulating gas on Earth is carbon dioxide. Small imbalances between the geologic release rate of carbon dioxide and the geologic consumption rate of carbon dioxide, if they were sustained, would have led to very large changes in atmospheric CO2 level that would have imperiled Earth's habitability. This suggests that a negative feedback has regulated PCO2 over geologic time. A candidate mechanism for the weathering feedback is carbonate silica weathering feedback. This involves temperature dependent weathering of rocks on land, flushing cations to the ocean. Uh, there the cations react with dissolved inorganic carbon and make carbonates, uh, for example, CaCO3. This can be thought of as an acid-based titration, uh, where the acid is the carbonic acid uh, derived from uh, volcanic CO2. If the rate of weathering of rocks on land increases with planetary surface temperature, then we have a negative feedback uh, that can keep temperature within the habitable range, allowing surface liquid water. This is called the carbonate silicate weathering feedback. Now, aside, with only one data point, Earth, we can't know whether the continuous operation of the weathering feedback is an artifact of survivorship bias, meaning if things had worked differently, we wouldn't be here. It's hard even to be sure if the observation of long-term planet stability uh, on Earth itself results from survivorship bias. Uh, so we need uh, more data than just the Earth, not just because we just want more data points, but also because the observations we make on Earth are affected by the fact that we're here. But during the wet era that we're sending rovers to explore on Mars, at the times when the lakes were full and the rivers were flowing, Mars was a one plate planet. It had no seafloor spreading and no subduction. So it didn't have any uh, thermal recycling of carbonates. And even more than that, we don't see limestone. We actually see very little carbonate on Mars on average. Near infrared spectroscopic prospecting for carbonate on Mars has found only patchy outcrops, not enough to matter for regulating ancient climate. Uh, now it's just possible that carbonate is dispersed deep underground below detection levels, but
But basically, we don't have a rock buffered uh, carbon cycle on early Mars in the way that we do on modern Earth. And another difference is that Mars, even during the era of rivers and lakes, had much less water than Earth does today. So today, Mars has polar caps uh, that add up to about 30 meters global equivalent layer of water, which is only about 1% of Earth's value. Uh, deuterium isotope data uh, for ancient lake mods from the Curiosity Rover indicate that Mars had about three times more surface available water when the rivers were flowing. Enough to fill up seas potentially, but a lot less than Earth. So overall, early Mars had a household surface, at least intermittently, but it challenges our Earth-derived understanding of planetary habitability because whatever was responsible for early Mars habitability was not like what sustained modern Earth. So I want to take an even bigger step back and say the question, what allowed lakes on early Mars, opens up a much bigger and older question, which is, is our planet a fluke uh, or a habitable climate common in the universe? And the concept of the carbonate silicate weathering feedback is so useful in understanding Earth's history of long-term surface habitability, that when we think of the circumstellar habitable zone for planets in general, exoplanets, we think of it as the range of distances from the star within which climate stabilizing feedback might operate, might. So this concept guides the targeting of uh, space telescopes like James Webb Space Telescope, which launches this fall, and the design of their potential successors, uh, concepts like HabEx and Luhua. And there are lots of plants within this theoretical habitable zone. Now, early Mars is outside the habitable zone. That means that however much carbon dioxide you put into Mars's atmosphere, early Mars's atmosphere, it is too cold for liquid water. But we know from the Mars missions that early Mars was habitable, at least intermittently. So in the first test of our Earth-derived understanding of planetary habitability, that understanding has proven wrong, not once, but twice. First, Mars lacks tectonic cycling and extensive carbonates, which means that the carbonate silicate weathering feedback probably wasn't responsible for the lake forming planets. Second, Mars received such little light from the young sun that even if the carbonate silicate weathering cycle did work, it couldn't adjust the CO2 to the levels needed for surface lakes, simply because no amount of carbon dioxide can give surface lakes on early Mars. So this is good news. Uh, when our best theories uh, don't match the data, uh, that means we're gonna learn something. Uh, we are basically on the hunt for a powerful, non-CO2 greenhouse warming agent that, importantly, can stick around for long enough to explain the lakes and match the geologic data. And this is the early Mars climate problem. Um, so I want to say a little bit about the relationship between solar system work and exoplanet work. Um, Mars will continue to be useful in the coming era of rocky exoplanet data because long time series, billions of years, from solar system stratigraphic archives, so the rock record uh, history, those complement the ensemble of snapshot observations of exoplanets. Um, so we have lots of data points, but we don't have the deep mystery when we look at uh, exoplanets. Mars is the only planet uh, known to record a major habitability transition in its sediments uh, from more habitable in the past to less habitable now. And by studying Mars, we get to study a different habitability supporting mechanism from the one that we think sustains habitability on Earth. So here's the history of lakes on Mars, the state of knowledge a few years ago. We see the traces of multiple lake forming climates, the green spikes here. I'm not showing catastrophic groundwater outflows here, although they did occur. Our record is biased towards recording the wettest times in Mars history because water is needed for aqueous cementation for sedimentary rocks to form. So there are gaps between the green spikes where we don't know what's going on. Uh, so notice the time axis isn't uniform. Most of the action is during the first half of Mars history. Also, we don't see the first few hundred million years uh, because that's been resurfaced. We see regionally integrated valley networks at the Noachian Hesperian boundary. Later, we see lakes that are patchy and tend to not be linked by long rivers. These late stage lakes are hundreds of meters deep. And they're surprising because they post almost all of the impacts on Mars. 
long after Mars's magnetic field, uh, global geodynamo had died, and after most of the volcanism as well. So that late persistence of late forming climates is a constraint on models. Uh, the prevailing view is that the river stopped flowing because of loss of carbon dioxide to space. Uh, however, that conclusion is premature. And as I will argue today, there are other possibilities. And just mapping and sequencing the ancient wet episodes isn't enough. We need quantitative summary parameters that can be used as input or test data for numerical models, both of Mars climate and Mars climate evolution. How wet was it? Uh, how uh, long was it wet for? How many wet events were there? And what was the intermittency of the climate? And we can now get answers to many of these questions with a big help coming from uh, digital terrain models of well-preserved river deposits, uh, like the one shown here. Okay, so our overall approach to the early Mars climate problem is to combine early Mars data analysis and early Mars modeling, including climate modeling, under one roof. So I'd like to thank all of the uh, students, postdocs, and RAs who've worked with me on figuring out early Mars climate. Uh, today's talk will emphasize a GCM project, which uh, Liam Steele, uh, who is now at JPL, uh, did a good half of the work, and also important contributions from our collaborator, Michael Mishnah. So I want to walk through some of the geologic constraints before I get into the modeling. Uh, these matter because they've caused a lot of models for what warmed early Mars, a lot of hypotheses for the powerful non-CO2 warming agent that we need, to fall by the wayside over the last few years. The mass balance of water and sediment from paleo lakes with deltas like Jezero can be used to constrain the lifetime of individual lakes. They lasted at least centuries. This matters because it rules out wet climates where the energy source for runoff was the kinetic energy of individual impacts. Impact induced wet climates after the, the very earliest stage of Mars history uh, would have lasted less than a year. Next, we can use the frequency of impact craters interbedded within the ancient sediments, uh, within the river deposits, to estimate the time spanned by those river deposits. And it's at least 100 million years. We use digital terrain models to measure hundreds of river deposit dimensions, finding that rivers on early Mars were, for a given drainage area, uh, wider than the Earth, than on Earth. And this gives peak runoff production rates that were intense. This matters because in combination with the 100 million year number, it implies intermittency. The rivers could not have been operating continuously at these rates because if they had, then we would see even more total rock erosion than the up to one kilometer that we do see. So what was the total duration of liquid water if, if things were intermittent? Uh, well, there's orbital forcing of quasi-periodic layers in the sedimentary rocks. So by carrying the orbitally forced beds and bundles, we get a total duration of liquid water uh, that was uh, more than 10 million years, uh, probably much longer. Uh, this is work mostly by uh, Kevin Lewis. So what were the boundary conditions for these wet climates? Well, an important boundary condition is the atmospheric pressure. Uh, here, when we find small, impact craters into better within the sediments, uh, then that gives us an upper limit on past atmospheric pressure because if the atmosphere is thick, uh, the impact doors will burn up in the atmosphere instead of making a crater. And so this sets an upper limit on past atmospheric pressure that's not much more than one bar. And uh, the tilt of the spin axis towards the sun is an important boundary condition. Um, we've figured out how to use elliptic crater orientations to get the ancient obliquity. Uh, we found it wasn't much different on time average than the Earth. Um, however, uh, Mars's obliquity is much more time variable uh, than the Earth's. So this is just a constraint on the mean obliquity. Uh, finally, we have lots of indications that the climate was arid. Uh, so uh, I'll be discussing that later in the talk. So how do models for the unknown non-CO2 climate warming agent uh, stack up against these new constraints? So uh, explaining rivers and lakes on early Mars is difficult uh, because carbon dioxide alone is not enough. So we need non-CO2 warming and most hypotheses do not fare well when compared to the geologic constraints. So I'll focus on the two that line up best uh, with the geologic constraints. Uh, one candidate mechanism for the extra warming 
is reducing gases such as hydrogen. In this scenario, reducing gases are released from underground fast enough that they can build up to a mass several times that of Mars's modern atmosphere in 100,000 years or so. And if that happened, then it could give 10 to the five years of warm climate, provided that the background CO2 atmospheric pressure was uh, one bar or more. If the background CO2 atmospheric pressure was less, then the hydrogen warming is ineffective. Another candidate is warming by water ice clouds. Yaracha and Toon found that the cloud greenhouse could give warm climates of 0.25 bars of CO2, potentially even less. Cloud warming involves only processes operating today. Even today, this is a, a composite of pictures taken from orbiters. Uh, Mars has water ice clouds, uh, shown here near the equator. Uh, this is a water ice cap. Uh, although these water ice clouds are too patchy to warm the surface much on Mars today. So, uh, uh, however, um, the cloud greenhouse has proven difficult to replicate. And since the original Urara and two proposal, uh, no one has really advocated for it. Um, the uh, uh, problem is that a key control of the strength of the cloud greenhouse is cloud height. If the clouds are high, then the greenhouse effect is strong. Um, that's because for Mars absorbed solar radiation equals outgoing long-wave radiation in steady state. But if the clouds are optically thick, then the outgoing long-wave radiation is launched from a level in the atmosphere that's no lower than the cloud top height, where I'm loosely using cloud top height as synonymous with depth at which the clouds uh, become optically thick. Um, so that plus the adiabatic lapse rate constrains the surface temperature to be tens of Kelvin warmer than if there were no clouds, at least in a simple one dimensional picture. The problem is that there are lots of ways to get clouds that do not fit uh, these criteria. You also need uh, the cloud particle size to be more than 10 microns. Indeed in 3D, so far other models can't get high clouds and so they don't get much cloud warming. Um, it, so overall the water ice cloud greenhouse for early Mars has proven uh, difficult to replicate and has been argued to require unrealistic cloud lifetimes and unrealistic cloud coverage. Uh, so no paper is advocated for cloud warming as a solution to the early Mars climate problem uh, since the original Urala and Tune 2013 paper. Um, but let me say a bit about why the cloud greenhouse uh, can work in 1D. Um, this power of the cloud greenhouse is because water ice forward scatters uh, in visible light um, and uh, absorbs thermal infrared. Forward scattering only slowly attenuates uh, vis uh, uh, diffuse sunlight, but by contrast, absorption exponentially attenuates upwelling on wave radiation, uh, giving that greenhouse effect. So that basically guarantees that for large ice particles, you will get a range of cloud thicknesses that lets diffuse sunlight in, uh, but traps infrared. And it turns out to be optical thickness of order unity. So to test the early Mars cloud greenhouse hypothesis in three dimensions, we use the Mars Wolf uh, Global Climate Model. We used an ice cap water source whose location we varied. Uh, just as for modern Mars, clouds can be found far from the water source. So these clouds are thousands of kilometers uh, close to the equator than their water source, which is the polar cap. Um, the ice particle radius depends on early Mars dust abundance because dust serves as ice nuclei. Um, so ice particle radius on early Mars depends on the relative efficiency of uh, dust aerosol production by wind erosion versus dust aerosol consumption by sediment induration. Both of these are unknown, both of these rates are unknown. So we leave uh, dust abundance and therefore ice particle radius as a free parameter. Um, our cloud microphysics includes a sampling of individual cloud particles um, plus a parameterization of snowfall. It's a, a, a terrestrial cirrus type scheme. We found uh, that a cloud greenhouse uh, can warm a Mars-like planet to global uh, average annual mean temperature 265 Kelvin, uh, which is warm enough for low latitude lakes and stay warm for centuries or longer. So this is the steady state outcome from a cold dry start. Uh, here the X's correspond to stable surface snow and ice. 
Um, for this simulation, that's basically the South Pole um, plus uh, some ice on a mountain at 40 North. So the black contour lines here are uh, topographic elevation in meters. So this is uh, the low average elevation, this is above average elevation. Um, these are symbols for rovers. So this is perseverance, this is curiosity, and this is the location for the uh, Chinese Tianwen one, which lands in a couple of months, hopefully. Um, the, uh, the ice is only on the South Pole because uh, the North Pole is lower lying topographically, so it's warmer, so the ice isn't stable there. Um, and this is just the uh, mean annual temperature in Kelvin, so red is above uh, freezing. So our GCM actually doesn't resolve the impact craters that Perseverance and Curiosity are sitting in. Um, but uh, taking into account the anti-correlation between local elevation and local temperature, our model implies uh, annual average temperatures above freezing for all rover landing sites. Um, also, if we impose uh, Mars's present day orbital parameters, then we see a green zone, which is everything between these green lines here, um, a 100 day interval with average temperature above freezing happens every year in the latitude belt between 30 south and 50 north. Uh, so much warmer than modern Mars, uh, uh, warm enough for liquid water, uh, even though the sun is fainter. Um, as with previous 1D models, uh, we find that 10 micron and 20 micron radius cloud particles can give a warm climate, but five micron radius cloud particles cannot, just because they're the wrong size to efficiently absorb the upwelling infrared radiation. So here's the atmosphere structure in latitude height coordinates. So the cloud water ice mixing ratio is in blue terms. The temperature is in green contours, temperature in Kelvin, uh, and the relative humidity is in red contours. So these clouds have optical depth about one or more, but they're physically tenuous. Uh, a few parts per million uh, uh, by weight of water and a column abundance of only tens of precipitable microns. So stable warm climates involve vapor equilibrium with surface ice only at locations that are much colder than the planet average. So the high altitudes of clouds that are horizontally distant from those surface cold traps uh, maximize warming. Cloud cover is nearly global in the GCM, so here's why. The residence time of water substance in this model atmosphere is more than one year, which is two orders of magnitude longer than on Earth. Uh, this long residence time ensures a low level water mixing ratio that is uniform to within 20% or so. So atmospheric water substance has a residence time that is longer than the atmospheric mixing time. So except at surface cold traps, uh, in, oh, so this is a separate point. Uh, so except at surface cold traps, individual cloud particles don't fall to the surface. Instead, they resublimate re just below the cloud base without being transported far from the cloud and moisten the subcloud layer. Uh, and atmospheric water has no sink <clears throat> except for the spatially restricted surface cold traps. For these reasons, the well-mixed water vapor bearing layer extends to high altitude, where it condenses as a global capping cloud layer. This basic behavior, which is very different from modern Earth's atmospheric water cycle, has been suggested previously for modern Venus uh, and uh, uh, Titan. <clears throat> In the early Mars model, this cloud cap provides strong greenhouse warming. Now, water ice cloud formation of hydrogen outgassing are uh, natural processes, and here we're talking about warming early Mars. Um, this scenario is attractive because cloud aerosol warming requires less mass to get warming, uh, four orders of magnitude less mass than the alternative. So for water ice clouds, five gigatons, it, five billion tons is 30 precipital microns column. That's similar to polar hood clouds on modern Mars. By contrast, Building up 30,000 gigatons of hydrogen requires erupting about 100 million cubic kilometers of magma in 100,000 years. And that's because hydrogen could be quite rapidly lost by escape to space, uh, diffusion limited escape. Um, this doesn't disprove the hydrogen hypothesis uh, because there may be other mechanisms for making hydrogen other than volcanic outgassing. Um, this slide shows global models spin up uh, from a cold dry start. Uh, takes about 40 years of simulated time. The spatially restricted surface water ice distribution uh, in steady state 
is in equilibrium with the one planet. Um, so neither gaining nor losing ions. Um, this switch from a cold to a warm climate is so fast that if there is patchy snowpack at low latitudes, then it will melt in place rather than having enough time to sublimate away. Um, so we find warm climates uh, when cloud particle radius is fixed at 10 microns or bigger, uh, which is well within the range observed for modern Mars clouds. Now for early Mars, we don't know that the conditions for 10 microns were ever achieved. Um, so this remains a hypothesis to be tested, uh, but it is consistent with the geologic data we have in hand because that geologic data suggests that early Mars had a warm and arid climate. In arid climates, uh, lakes can be fed by groundwater flow uh, or transiently by melting of pre-existing ice following a cold to warm transition. Um, we did a test to check that the warm arid climate that we simulated is a uh, little affected by uh, filling up the lakes uh, with surface water uh, in locations where we know there were lakes. Uh, in this test, however, the lakes are losing water every year by evaporation. Um, and so uh, that water is deposited on uh, the ice caps. But ice cap based on melting and uh, groundwater flow might balance this atmospheric flux and so close this water cycle, which has previously been proposed by many workers. Um, so in this case, a warm arid Mars climate that includes low latitude groundwater upwelling could self-sustain indefinitely and the cloud greenhouse makes the atmospheric part of this previously hypothesized ancient water cycle physically self-consistent. More work is needed to test these proposed mechanisms. Nevertheless, the potential of the cloud greenhouse climate to explain geologic data is strong. Uh, so the Curiosity River is now driving upwards into uh, sulfate bearing rocks, uh, which uh, will hopefully test our hypotheses. Um, so uh, measurements that will be important include isotopic measurements and uh, looking for the flow direction of uh, ancient streams. Now, we do get a cold climate in our model if we allow for extensive uh, surface water ice for example, ice everywhere on high ground. That's because uh, the ice over much of the surface buffers the relative humidity to about one, uh, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, over much of the surface. So clouds form near the surface because they don't have to ascend much to hit the conversation level. So, uh, but low clouds cool. Uh, they don't provide much greenhouse effect and they scatter sunlight back to space. So a cold climate results. This effect, <clears throat> the dependence of the climate outcome on the spatial extent of surface water ice can account for the discrepancy between previous cloud greenhouse GCLs. So considering these results together, we see that changes in the spatial extent of surface water ice can account for the discrepancy, uh, 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 can cause changes in the strength of the cloud greenhouse warming. And this can cause alternations, intermittency in the warm climates which we probably need uh, to explain the geologic record. Now, the extent of surface water ice did vary over Mars history. Uh, we've got water loss to space. We've got growth of volcanoes. Uh, we've got orbital change, which is shifting the ice around. And we've also got the formation of lag deposits on top of ice. So impermeable uh, dust and sand uh, armoring um, uh, ice underneath. For example, debris covered glaciers. Um, and this has been pointed out by, uh, they're not on the slides, so I'll read them out. Uh, Andrews, Hannah, and Lewis, 2011, uh, Mishner and Richardson, 2005, and many others. So this is a plausible driver for the intermittency in warm climates that we infer from the geologic record. And so I just want to emphasize one possible mechanism because we see it on modern Mars. Uh, I'm not saying this was the mechanism, it's just a, a particularly, um, it's particularly active on modern Mars. So on Mars today, we've got a North Polar Ice Cap and a South Polar Ice Cap. But from the point of view of the modern water cycle, so Mars' uh, modern water, uh, atmospheric water cycle, the South Polar Cap might as well not be there because it's protected by what appears as smooth and brown on this page, which is a lag deposit of a few meters of dust. And so that totally takes the uh, South Polar Ice Cap out of commission. Um, but lag deposits like this are topographically superficial and have waxed and waned over geologic time. 
And so the spatial extent of surface water that's you know, it, uh, contributing to the climate um, has also waxed and waned um, over uh, geologic time. Okay, so considering these results together, um, we, oh, sorry. So the take home is that the cloud greenhouse works uh, if and only if the surface water ice distribution is patchy. Our results reconcile previous discrepant results by showing that the cloud greenhouse provides strong warming if the surface has patchy surface water cover, but not if the surface has very extensive water cover. In our model, arid, warm, stable climates emerge that involve surface water and low clouds, only at locations much colder than the average surface temperature. At locations horizontally distant from the surface cold traps, clouds are found only at high altitudes and that maximizes cloud warming. This scenario is consistent with geologic data. So our results support the uh, uh, cloud warming hypothesis as an alternative to the hydrogen CO2 collision induced absorption hypothesis for warming early Mars. So our GCM results do not rule out either hypothesis. Uh, fortunately, the Perseverance mission can test these ideas. First, in most models of hydrogen CO2 collision induced absorption warming. Uh, question? No? Oh. Okay. Um, the warming intervals last 100,000 years. But in the model presented here, the warming intervals can last much longer. So, geologic evidence for multi million year continuously warmer intervals, for example, from embedded craters would favor the cloud greenhouse model. Second, rover data enables independent tests of the low uh, river era PCO2 um, implied by uh, some other work that we've done that uh, I won't be talking about today that's currently in review. Um, therefore, uh, rover observations of, for example, uh, small embedded craters um, could uh, disprove the hydrogen CO2 collision-induced absorption hypothesis because that requires high CO2 um, and uh, favoring other models such as the cloud greenhouse that don't require high CO2. So what was responsible for the end of early Mars warm climates? Um, so this slide sums up uh, a lot of data, uh, including some new data points that um, we have uh, acquired using by comparing the distribution of ancient rivers as a function of time to GCM models of river distribution for different CO2 levels. Um, so, the, uh, so most of the points on this uh, are data from others. Uh, we, we, we got the uh, gold points and the green points. Um, so uh, the reason that the gray band, uh, th th there's still uncertainty at the present time, even though we know what Mars' atmospheric pressure is, is that there's uh, CO2 adsorbed to the regolith of Mars that could come out uh, if the temperature gets higher. And there's also CO2 stored as CO2 ice at the poles that presumably comes out when the obliquity uh, is higher because then the poles point at the sun and they get warmer. And so the gray band uh, represents uncertainty in how much uh, CO2 there is sequestered in those two relatively accessible uh, reservoirs because they probably come out on million year time scales. Um, and uh, these are um, Maven and Mars Express loss rates extrapolated back to the past with uncertainty, which gets worse uh, when the, you move in, uh, further into the past because the sun is more active, so the loss rates are higher, but the XUV and uh, solar wind drivers are more intense. So this is a synthesis of uh, a lot of work by the community. Um, so the decline over time is as expected. So these results are consistent with the hypothesis that the decline of surface habitability on Mars was associated with atmospheric decay. Um, but we have new data suggesting that the decline below Earth-like atmospheric pressure is earlier than expected relative to the geologic record, because it's still wet at this time, and relative to predictions from habitable zone theory. Um, so for those keeping score, uh, this means that the habitable zone hypothesis has now failed at Mars, which is the first place you can test it independent of the Earth data, which it's based on. 
It's failed three times. First was the lack of carbonates and carbonate recycling. Second was the need for a non-CO2 greenhouse warming agent, a powerful one. Third is that the CO2 level is nowhere near the optimum for habitability. So, whoop, changes over time in the distribution of Mars, Peri rivers in space um, suggest that uh, sustained strong non-CO2 greenhouse warming is required because the CO2 levels were low for late stage rivers. Um, water loss likely also contributed to the observed changes in river distribution. Um, so this suggests that CO2, uh, high levels of CO2 are not only insufficient, we already knew that, but also unnecessary to explain rivers. So this actually opens the door to other possible explanations uh, for the final end of river forming climates on Mars. Um, it could be further water loss. It could be further carbon dioxide loss. That remains a possibility. Uh, but it could also just be a reduction in non-CO2 uh, greenhouse warming. If you lose the gray bar, then you lose the rivers, even if the CO2 levels are constant. Um, so, uh, widening the picture to talk about exponents a little bit. So searches for habitable exoplanets are guided by the Haugelson concept. This concept predicts that habitable worlds should have high PCO2 if they are near the cold edge of the habitable zone. However, we find that Mars near the cold edge of the habitable zone supported river forming climates at low average PCO2. This raises the likelihood of false negatives in the search for habitable exoplanets. And there's more. Uh, so far, rocky exoplanet atmosphere detection has used methods that do not reliably detect uh, 100 millibar atmospheres. Um, at uh, 100 millibar average atmospheric pressure, Mars had a surface climate that was habitable, at least intermittently. So that means that non detection of an atmosphere on an exoplanet does not preclude its surface habitability. Um, but uh, lots of James Webb time is going to be spent on hunting for atmospheres and rocky exoplanets. And so uh, I'm uh, a part of some of these searches and I'm very excited for the next couple of years uh, to build up a theory for atmosphere presence absence as a function of planet mass, distance from the star and so on. Okay, so that's the main uh, science part of the talk. Uh, I now want to uh, uh, talk about some uh, ideas that we're uh, still working on. So today, uh, Mars's surface is sterilizing the life as we know it. Um, so the two times 10 to the 16 watts of sunlight that reaches Mars's surface is uh, useless for life as we know it. Um, that's actually the same number as sunlight reaching lands on our planet, like a lot of things that you wouldn't expect to cancel do cancel, as a measure of the kind of biosphere that you can have with that much energy. And so it's an interesting uh, exercise to see if we could establish uh, or perhaps re-establish uh, a photosynthetic biosphere on Mars. So at a minimum, we'd have to uh, warm the surface, it's too cold right now, uh, cut the surface UV flux and scrub the perchlorates from the soil. So uh, Mars's soil has a lot of uh, perchlorates, about one weight percent. I'm gonna ignore the UV flux problem and I'm gonna ignore the soil chemistry problem. And I'm just going to focus on warming the surface, which is a necessary but insufficient step. So whoop, the anticipated ease of uh, implementation of warming Mars uh, in, in the near future has varied over the years. So the first probes showed a planet that superficially resembled the moon uh, with a tenuous atmosphere. So that was a sort of an idea. Uh, but calculations by McKay uh, building on work by Carl Sagan, showed that Mars could be close to a tipping point that would release abundant CO2 back into the atmosphere, uh, warming the planet. Then uh, Mimi Gerstel showed that uh, super greenhouse gases, for example, chlorofluorocarbons, which as well as being bad for the ozone are uh, very powerful greenhouse gases, uh, could warm Mars. Uh, Margarita Maranova found the optimal cocktail of super greenhouse gases to do this. Uh, you need about 40 gigatons in the atmosphere. Uh, however, Joukowsky and Edwards underscored in a 2018 paper that uh, the tipping point idea doesn't work. Um, 
not only is the less than 50 millibars of CO2 stored as dry ice on Mars, but we haven't found big carbonate deposits. A lot of CO2 has been lost to space irreversibly. Uh, but recently things are looking up uh, thanks to a silica aerogel local warming study by Laura Kerber and Robin Wordsworth and our own global warming work, which I will now describe. So earlier uh, we found that cloud aerosol warming is very effective as a natural warming mechanism. Um, but what about artificial aerosols? Here an idea that might work <clears throat> is the radar chaff principle. If you cut metal strips to half the wavelength of your radar, uh, say a couple of centimeters, and you drop them out of your plane, then they will interfere with the radar beams. So for warming Mars, uh, we would need to observe, absorb upwelling thermal radiation, uh, not radar. So we need a length of about 10 microns, and we want the particles to be small in cross-sectional area so they drift with the wind. Uh, so if you imagine the ice cloud particles from the first part of the talk, these would be about the same size and longest dimension, but needle-shaped instead of equant. Um, so for material, uh, iron works fine. Um, the absorption cross-section for these metal particles is larger than for natural water ice particles. And the cross-sectional area to volume ratio is hundreds of times better, which is where most of the advantage lies. So with these, you can plug the uh, CO2 windows, which is uh, how Mars is cooled. Um, so you basically got one at, uh, uh, you've got a sort of 8 to 12 micron uh, window and then another gray region uh, where um, Mars can radiate to space. And so um, the required mass to warm Mars this way is about 0 0.03 gigatons. Um, so three orders of magnitude less mass um, needed for this method than for greenhouse gases. The biggest unknown is the lifetime of these particles in the atmosphere. Just as for natural Mars dust, if you inject them into the planetary surface layer during the daytime, then they'll be lofted to great heights. Um, it's hard to avoid them being entombed in the seasonal carbon dioxide ice cap, um, but I guess the sublimation wind during the spring will be strong enough to loft them again. But that is a guess, and so the lifetime in the atmosphere could be as short as a few years. Um, but if you have a lifetime of uh, 10 years, then the volume that you need to inject into the atmosphere every Mars day, or Mars day is about as long as Earth day, is about 10 liters per second. Um, so there are three ingredients at least needed for this idea to uh, actually get it working. Um, one is you need 3D metal printing. So the weighty stuff, uh, for manufacturing uh, these particles uh, gets built on Mars. And 3D metal printing uh, is uh, being developed by a company called Relativity, Relativity Space that's based in California. Um, but even if you do most of the manufacturing on Mars, you still need a capability of learning things on Mars that's much greater than uh, say, you know, the roughly one ton at a time that we have with uh, Lang rovers on Mars. And so uh, the uh, SpaceX is building a, a spacecraft uh, called uh, Starship, uh, which is uh, 100 tons to the Mars surface per flight. And this, uh, uh, they, they were recently given a $3 billion contract uh, to uh, develop uh, this for NASA. Um, and we also need uh, reserves of uh, metal uh, or, or uh, iron ore, ideally. And it turns out that the Curiosity River has driven over uh, near ore grade uh, hematite and magnetite deposits. And so uh, uh, that's been confirmed with X-ray diffraction. So just along the Curiosity Traverse, we have uh, the raw materials uh, needed to make these particles. Um, so that concludes um, the discussion of things we're working on now. So I'll just uh, leave up my conclusion slide. Oop, and uh, happy to take any questions. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Yeah, Thanks was, uh, a lot. This great. was uh, very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. we are now open to questions. Srini, do you have any questions? Yeah, maybe. Um, I like the optimism of your talk. Uh, I, I thought it was optimistic. Um, 
so when you say the rivers and lakes were intermittent on the Mars surface, how many cycles do you think uh, have been gone through and uh, how uh, long have they lasted? Uh, do you know anything? Uh, our constraints are weak. Uh, we know that individual lake forming climates uh, lasted at least centuries for the longest ones. Uh, but, it, but, but it could be millions of years. We don't have a good upper bound, okay. but the lower bound is at least centuries. In terms of the number, uh, at least three, but probably probably many more than that. At least three. Okay. Um, earlier I asked uh, about how long uh, a data set you have on Mars. Uh, I was actually uh, motivated uh, by a stupid reason perhaps. You know that there's a group of people uh, which thinks that the climate change on Earth is uh, more a response to the solar cycle. And um, do we know if what has happened to the uh, Mars climate as the solar cycles have waxed and waned? Um, so uh, let me give a two-part answer. Um, so uh, the first part is about the hypothesis that uh, the warming of Earth is due to solid variability and not to carbon dioxide. Uh, so uh, that's not true. Maybe in 1999 you could have made that argument, uh, but the warming. I know. Of there are, I know. I know. I was. Uh, I'm not taking any responsibility for that statement. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Uh, but so then, I, me, I know yeah. there are a number of others. But I wanted to know if, in fact, we can somehow say something about, about that more definitively, perhaps knowing what's happened on Mars or something like that. Uh, uh, okay, so we're on the same page, but let me just uh, finish the first part of my answer for the, for, for the audience, even though you and I agree. So yeah. uh, the, uh, um, the, the evidence uh, that uh, human uh, CO2 emissions are primarily responsible for 21st century warming uh, is, is overwhelming, uh, uh, simply because the uh, uh, solar irradiance and uh, solar inputs um, are not changing that much from one solar cycle to the next, whereas we have a monotonic uh, rise yeah. both in carbon dioxide and in temperature. Okay. Uh, okay, now the question for, for, for the history of Earth's climate about this role of the sun and also the galaxy in the history of Earth's climate is a fascinating and uh, unresolved one. Um, so you could have thousand year uh, cycles in solar variability that might not be caught well by our records. Uh, yeah. You could have long term changes in the strength of Earth's magnetic field, which affect cosmic ray inputs in, uh, in, into, into the climate. And it's really hard to study those using the Earth alone. Fortunately, we have the Mars North Polar Ice Cap, which entombs uh, 4 million years of the details of Mars' climate history, so isotope variations, volcanic inputs, and so on. And so by drilling an ice core on Mars and comparing it to an ice core on Earth, we'd have a really good test of the role of the sun and the galaxy in climate on Earth, uh, because any changes that happen on the same time on Mars yeah. and Earth must be due to either solar variability or galactic inputs, right? Um, so I think it would be a fascinating exercise for understanding Earth's paleoclimate um, to go drill an ice core on Mars and the upper process to do that. It would be expensive, but I think worth it. Yeah, that's great. Okay, I didn't feel so stupid after you answered my question. So. Thank you. Good question. So I see a yeah. question in chat. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, the question in chat is, what if Mars never had a steady state, warm and wet climate? What does this mean for the search for past life on the surface? Um, so uh, we're mostly looking from orbit. We don't have many rovers. From orbit, we can't tell if the times between the uh, lake forming climates uh, were uh, completely sterile, like the modern Mars surface, or a more horrible situation like, for example, uh, present day on Earth, Atacama Desert, where there is, we, we don't see lakes uh, in the present day hyper arid core of the Atacama Desert, but microbes can uh, survive. Um, so we don't, uh, so it's possible that the surface 
in the early times was habitable for a long time, just, just very dry. Um, so uh, my opinion, however, is that uh, we, sh we should go deeper and we should look earlier into the first few hundred million years of Mars history, which aren't well preserved, obviously aren't easy to reconstruct from orbit. Um, and so this means looking not at the nice layered intact sedimentary rocks and dolls, but instead looking at the jumbled remains thrown up by impacts of Mars's first few hundred million years, when I think it could have been even uh, uh, wetter or more habitable um, than, than the well studied rocks we see. The good news is there is a plan to do this. Uh, so Perseverance, the rover that landed a couple of months ago, uh, after it's done its work at the Delta, it's gonna drive over the crater rim and go to some beautiful mega breccia deposits. And the mega breccia deposits uh, are a grab bag of uh, really, 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 really ancient rocks on Mars um, from the first few hundred million years of Mars history, uh, scooped up by a giant impact, and um, uh, hopefully we'll get some samples of those from Perseverance. Um, so, so I think the answer to your question is, uh, we definitely want to sample rocks from Mars's very earliest history in addition to the well-preserved layered sedimentary rocks. Oh, and before I move, move on from that question, sorry. Um, uh, there's also uh, search for subsurface life, um, which is hard uh, because right now we don't even know if there's liquid water at depth on present day Mars. Radars have searched for it and not found it. That doesn't mean it's not there, but we don't know where to drill uh, if, we, if we don't know where the water is. Uh, but yeah, this, this is the possibility that sub, sub, of subsurface life in addition to surface life. Right. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, please raise your hand or type it out. Yeah, there is one question, Bob Johnson. Yeah, Bob, go ahead. You probably mentioned early on, and I apologize, I was late getting on, but uh, is there any role of this idea that the loss of the magnetic field plays a role or not? Is that just a coincidence and has nothing to do with the issue? Um, the, the quick answer is that the uh, rivers and lakes that I was emphasizing in this talk uh, post-date the loss of the Giordano by uh, over a billion years okay. based on the best okay. available okay. Uh, I don't think uh, that means that the loss of the magnetic field uh, you know, is unimportant. Presumably when the loss of the magnetic field was lost, then uh, the rate of atmospheric loss presumably went up. But, but, but the chronology doesn't really work for these late stage lakes. And uh, if, if, if the speaker is uh, uh, Robert Johnson, the atmospheric loss ec expert, then you already know what I'm about to say, but for the rest of the audience, uh, it, if you start with a plant with no magnetic fields and you gradually increase the magnetic field strength, then models suggest that you actually get an increase in the atmospheric loss rate for weak magnetic fields. Uh, but then you go back to a reduction in, in atmospheric loss rate for high magnetic field strength. Okay. All right, if there are no more questions, then uh, let us thank uh, Edwin again. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. Look forward to more uh, for data and learning more about this stuff and uh, getting more. All right, thank you, bye. -bye. Thank See you for you. the invitation. Take care, yeah, have a good day. You guys. Bye. Bye. bye.